as I began to cut off the relationship with my mom and my sister, it really made me unable to relate to women at all, which led to further rejection. And it became this snowball of um, more and more rejection and feeling like I was bad, like I wasn't a good person, like I wasn't worth people's time, I wasn't worth being loved, um, and that I should have been a boy. Even in a time of culture wars and controversy about almost everything, there are few subjects as difficult to discuss as transgender rights. In less than a decade, the number of young people identifying as trans has exploded, and with it, the number of arguments about the subject. In British schools, nearly 80% of teachers report trans-identified or non-binary students in their classroom. Supporters say being trans is innate, like being gay, and that this is like the gay rights movement of 30 years ago, with lots of trans kids coming out of the closet to be themselves. But critics say being trans is not innate, and that many kids are identifying as the opposite sex because it's cool and because they are being indoctrinated by a new ideology, fed to them on social media and by activist teachers. The debates have become most heated when it comes to actual medical transitioning. In all the disagreement, what frequently gets lost is the need for compassion for anyone struggling with dysphoria. But how far should compassion go? Should it allow any teenager who says they are trans to medically transition? What about the increasing number of studies showing that many such kids have other serious mental health issues? I'm speaking today to one person who knows all about the dilemmas and the debates surrounding this issue. Laura, who was born female, lived as a young man for almost nine years. She took cross-sex hormones for years and had two major surgeries. She now regrets ever having done it, has detransitioned, and wants to warn others of the dangers. She is here to tell her story. Laura, thanks for joining us today. Now, you have an incredible journey and story here that we are going to break down, but you lived as a transgender man named Jake for nearly a decade. Can you describe for us the moment when you first started to doubt your biological gender? Yeah, I was really young, and I, I didn't understand the, the things that may have led up to that. I was, um, you know, I was five years old or so, and, and when I... I want to clarify too, for anyone that's hearing this story, I have so many people that say, well, I never um, had trauma or I was never abused or, you know, I didn't have problems with my parents, whatever it might be. When I went into that lifestyle, I would have told you I was born that way. I've always felt that way. I can remember feeling that way. It's so young. But now I look back and I think it's because we we block off, we, we bury so much pain. We build walls and we, we try to cut off things that have hurt. And so then we're just left with these feelings later. So I uh, just want to say that because I, I couldn't see these things at the time. But now I look back and I was really um, wounded as a child. I have really misunderstood the relationship with my mom. Uh, now, now that I'm um, older, I have so much grace for my mom and my parents and understanding how hard it is to be a parent and also understanding that she had her own brokenness that she'd really not dealt with. Um, but, you know, she had this very legalistic view of religion. Um, and so she she believed the Bible, but she really didn't understand what it was like to have a relationship with God. She didn't understand the goodness of God. You know, she she felt like she had to work really hard for God, which actually is what every religion in the world teaches, except for Christianity. You know, it's like every religion teaches us that we have to work our way to be good enough for God. And so this is the view she had. And so as a result, she was um, trying to be the super mom, super Christian, and she was burned out. She was stressed out. Um, she was so under so much stress that she really didn't ever want to be touched. She didn't want to be bothered. She had fibromyalgia. And so she couldn't even stand for the sheets to touch her at night. So she wanted to not ever be touched at all. And my, my love language was physical touch and quality time. And so this mom that was too stressed and too burned out, and it's like, just go away, get off of me, leave me alone, go to your room. And so I really began, I didn't understand her own pain. And so all I saw was that I wasn't good enough. I was annoying. And I believed all these things that, um, that I, I began to interpret based on her reactions. I begin to interpret about me. Um, and I, I begin to, instead of asking questions and trying to resolve this, um, I was kind of afraid. I was afraid to ask her questions. And so I would just look at things. And I, I noticed this relationship she had with my brother that was much closer. 
But I didn't understand. He was very quiet. He was very obedient. He was kind of the golden child, you know, and she'd miscarried two boys between my brother and I. And so she was very close to him for a lot of reasons. But as an, as an observer, I would just go, wow, mom wishes I had been a boy. And that's where that lie really began to start. And so I started acting like my brother. I started playing with his toys and wearing his clothes. And the more that I did, the more that I really began to um, be really jealous of my brother, to wish that I had been a boy. And I remember um, writing stories as a very young child. I remember writing stories about me as a boy character. And so I think over the years, and I would play lots of video games as well as a boy character. And so I was sort of had this alter ego and living vicariously through these different characters. And th then when I went to school, I didn't know how to relate to the girls. I'd never been close with my sister either. Um, so really had cut off my mom and my sister completely. I spent all my time with my dad and my brother. And so it's like, I, I just didn't know how to relate to girls. They were weird and they were foreign. And so I just... Um, and I think what we don't realize so often is that we build walls to protect ourselves because we're hurt. And it's like we can we can build a wall to sort of protect ourselves, but then we're not letting people in. Um, there's a verse in Proverbs that says, he who builds a high gate invites destruction. In other words, because we um, we make people jump through these hoops and we put our our door so high that like, you have to you have to do all these things to get in because we've, we're trying to protect ourselves. But actually, we're we're hurting ourselves because we're not letting people in. And so that's, as I begin to cut off the relationship with my mom and my sister, it really made me unable to relate to women at all, which led to further rejection. And it became this snowball of um, more and more rejection and feeling like I was bad, like I wasn't a good person, like I wasn't worth people's time, I wasn't worth being loved, um, and that I should have been a boy. You know, it's interesting how that started for you. How old were you when those initial issues with your mom started, where you became aware of, you know, she's trying to be the super mom, she's trying to do all these things, you're starting to feel about yourself inadequate. Do you remember how old you were? Yeah, I was about five. And I remember those feelings in kindergarten, which is interesting because I didn't make this connection until literally just a few days ago. I remembered that when I was five is when my mom went back to work. Um, when I was little, she was home all the time. And even though she was still home most of the, the hours that I was home, because she worked at a school, so we were home the same hours, but she wasn't having the time um, to do all the other things she needed to do. And so I, I think that's just part of the brokenness of this world. And she she all of a sudden was so much busier and so stressed. And just I remember, like, if I picture my mom from childhood, I still see the stress on her face. And just was like, just give me five minutes, just go away, you know, um, because she was just, she just couldn't handle life. You know, how, and I think this is an important detail, as you were going through this journey, and you talked about it being a snowballing effect, it's almost like a hamster wheel of just sort of running on this, and it's getting worse, and it's getting worse as it goes. How was your mom and your dad and your brother and your family, how were they reacting as you were starting to move more in that direction of rejecting your mother and your sister and moving more toward the men in your family? And the, I don't think anybody even realized it. Honestly, my, um, my sister, um, you know, we're, we're getting a lot closer now, but she was a, um, she became a professional horn player and she practiced hours and hours a day. And so I really had no relationship with my sister. Um, my brother was very, um, you know, we played a lot when I was very, very little, but, and I played with my dad and I was told I was just like my dad. You look just like your dad. You act just like your dad. You're two peas in a pod. And my dad, he went to every sporting event, every soccer game, every swim meet. I mean, and he would play games with me every single night. And so it just became, well, you know, Lara just enjoy spending time with her dad, which I did, but nobody realized, and I didn't even realize consciously, I don't think that I was not spending any time really with my mom or my sister. And I didn't understand. I don't think any of us understood the importance of that. You know, we've, we've been in this society for so long that says there's really no difference between men and women. What does it matter um, if a girl's not close to her mom? You know, but now in retrospect, I'm realizing that people really do or children really need their same sex parent. We need both. Um, that's what God intended. But we really need that same sex affirmation. 
You know, so we're talking here about the the roots of how this was all set and how you were feeling and where it was leading you. And it's so helpful to understanding the baseline of how you ended up where you were. But at some point, you reached a breaking point and you decided this wasn't just a feeling about which parent you wanted to spend time with. It was something much deeper. And you made the choice to try and transition your gender. What was that breaking point for you? Well, it really was after years of um, all kinds of sexual sin. And, you know, there, there's a reason that God um, put boundaries on sex. And it's not because God doesn't want us to have fun or to enjoy things. It's because God designed um, sex to, to bond us together inside the covenant of marriage um, with his blessing. And But as I was giving myself away to more and more and more men, and I was just, I was going through all of these relationships that were so broken. I was being used and dumped and rejected over and over and over and over again. And it really began to degrade my self-worth and self-value. And it began to kind of fracture me. Like I, I lost my identity because I just became this girl who was um, known for being, basically I was a slut and it, you know, but it was true. And I was having all these um, encounters and just giving myself away to anybody. But it really even started before I can remember when I was 14, I, the year before, actually, I had, so when I was 13, I dedicated my life to be a missionary. Um, but I didn't know that I had never really known God. I had been raised in this religious household. I knew that God had called me, but I had no idea that I didn't really know God. And when I was 14, I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. So I had cysts all over my ovaries and I was in so much chronic excruciating pain. And so I had this body that I didn't want in the first place because I didn't want to be a girl. And then I felt like God gave me to a mom that didn't want a girl. In my, in my mind, it wasn't actually true, but it's what I believed. And then I had these um, cysts that were just causing me chronic agony. And then the doctors were telling me I was likely never going to get pregnant. And so I thought, well, if God created me the, on this way on purpose and God doesn't make any mistakes, then God is a jerk. Like if this was intentional, then, then God hates me. And it's interesting to me because um, the Romans tells us that it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Um, but what, what I found, I several years ago, um, I was sick one weekend, and I literally watched hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of testimonies of how people came to know Jesus. And what I found fascinating is that almost every single case, what turned them away from the Lord, whatever knowledge they had of God, whether it was um, very minimal or whether they were raised in a Christian home, the thing that turned them all away from God um, was some form of this question, maybe not these exact words, but some form of, if God is good, why did he allow this in my life? And I think it's so profound that it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance, but it's the doubting God's goodness that turns us away from God. And I can remember that moment of thinking, like, if God did this to me on purpose, then, then I can't trust God. God is not good. And when I was 15, I told the Lord I would never trust him again, or I would never serve him again. I wanted nothing to do with it. I ran away from the faith. I wanted to be the opposite of a Christian. So you went from a missionary, you went from pledging yourself to be a missionary at 13, two years later yeah. with these struggles, everything you just described, escalating, rejecting God essentially entirely. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I blamed it on so many other things at the time. Like I had gotten into a Ouija board and, um, you know, all these like demonic things. But honestly, I look back, it was my own bitterness and unforgiveness that really began to turn my heart away from the Lord, doubting God's goodness, being angry, building these walls in my heart. Um, instead of forgiving my mom, I got angry and angry and angrier at her. And the Bible warns us, and in Hebrews 12, 15, and 16, it says that um, we've got to watch out. I'm paraphrasing just a bit, but it says, um, looking diligently or else um, we will become defiled. It says it leads to defilement, ultimately to sexual sin. And then it says, um, like Esau, so for those who don't know this story, um, he, was, um, he was the firstborn son and was entitled to this birthright, and he gave it away because he was... Um, because he was so hungry one day and he thought it was no value what he had this great gift he'd been given. But I see people do that with what they know of God so often that when we're hurt, we're wounded, we're bitter um, and we throw everything we know about God out the window and we judge God through other people rather than realizing that we're all 
fallen sinful people and we all hurt each other because none of us are God, but we all, we all blame God for the things that other people do to us. Even though we all want free will, if, if God forced us all to love him and serve him, we'd be robots. I mean, that, that'd be slavery. You know, we get so mad about slavery and yet we, we, we wish that God would make everybody else do what we wanted them to do. You know, God is loving and compassionate and that's why God allows free will. But so I didn't understand any of this. I didn't understand, you know, I was blaming everybody else for my problems. Um, and I was, you know, so mad at the world and felt so unjust. And I've been dealt a bad hand and I'd had lots of health problems. I just had all these reasons that my life stunk. and I was just mad, you know, and uh, but not feeling like I had any worth or value. And so I, I began to wish that I had been a man. I was deep into a pornography addiction. And as I fantasized about these things and I remember, um, playing these virtual sex games and fantasizing about being the man. And I begin to think, you know, if I had been the, the, the reason that these relationships n never work out, the reason I'm never happy is because I was supposed to be the man. If I was the man, I, kn I know how to treat a woman. And so I really began to um, fantasize about that more and more. I eventually looked it up on Google. I'd still never even heard the word. That's how much this has changed since 2007. Um, I'd never heard the word transgender, but I looked it up on Google. Um, and then I was shocked when all these results came up of all these people that felt like me. I found a support group and I went to the support group and within five minutes, they're like, oh, you are definitely transgender. It's like I belonged all of a sudden. I had, I felt understood and I felt known and seen. Affirmed. You were getting Absolutely. the affirmation that you felt like you weren't getting from your mom, from your family. In those in those moments, you know, you go there, you, you get that affirmation and clearly you're already feeling these things. It leads you down this path as you're engaging in that path and making these decisions. And we'll get into the finer details of what that looked like. How was this affecting your family, affecting your mother, the people you thought, the woman you thought maybe didn't care or, or wanted a boy? What was this like for her? Oh, it was so hard on my parents. It was kind of destroying them. I mean, they were just, they were reeling from, now I had been in years of rebellion before I um, came out as trans. I had gone so far away from the Lord. I was into a lot of parting, a lot of very dark things, um, full of anger and hatred. I made their lives hell the last couple of years. I lived at home as a teenager. They eventually sent me to Alaska to live with my uncle. I ended up, a, they sent me to a, a group home in Montana. And so I ended up, um, cause they just didn't know what to do. They were at their wits end and I was really, I was just spinning out of control. Um, and so they, they were just getting to this really desperate point, but I had kind of turned a bit of a corner at the, at the group home. I seemed to be doing a little better for a while. Um, they were kind of forcing me to be a Christian. And so for a while it seemed to be a little better. And I was secretly when I moved to, I moved to my own town, I got my own apartment um, they didn't know that I was struggling again and that I'd got back into all the sexual sin, back into pornography, back into partying. And so this was all kind of under the radar. But it's amazing to me how the Lord prepared them. They didn't realize it at the time, but God prepared them and they got into this Bible study and they started for the first time really digging into the word and really beginning to develop this relationship with God that was more than just going to church and they had read their Bible a lot before, but this time it was, they were really seeking God in a different way to know him and not just to like check the boxes. And so for about six months before I came out, God was really um, preparing them. Yeah. I want to ask you something just in case people are wondering, cause this, you've said this a couple of times and I think for Christians, they're going to understand what it means. Um, some though might, might not. And this idea of knowing God, Right. You know, because some people might think, well, if I go through the process, if I don't sin, if I don't harm other people, if I'm a nice person, I know God, I know who God is. But can you explain what that term actually means from from a Christian biblical perspective? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like the difference in knowing who somebody is. Um, like I, I, I know um, famous people like I know who um, Donald Trump is or, I know who, you know, Celine Dion is or whoever, like famous people. But to know somebody like I don't know them intimately. I don't know them as my friend. That's really the difference. And um, so I, I think like the Bible says that even the demons believe. I mean, there, there's a point where Jesus, I, you may not have ever heard the story, but like, um, I mean, for our audience, but um, 
where this guy comes to Jesus and he falls at his feet and these demons cry out and they call him the son of God. They believe, and there's so many people who have this intellectual knowledge. They believe it's true, but they don't know him. And really this is a, a work that God does in the heart where he reconciles. Us. There, there's, a, there's a gap between God and man. There's no way that we could ever reach God. Our arms are not that long. There's no, like, it's trying to, like, pay off a debt with monopoly money. No matter how many good works you do, you can never, ever earn righteousness with God. Um, the Bible says that even our, our righteousness is like filthy rags to God because we are so sinful. There's nothing we can do about our sinful condition, about our sinful heart, because we can't regenerate the heart. Um, but that's where Christ can. And that's that's the message of the gospel that I didn't understand, that I didn't know. And I had, I mean, I was like a yo-yo or a roller coaster all my life of like sometimes being really spiritual and then being complete opposite and then just back and forth. And back. I was a bipolar Christian. I mean, it's just, you know, um, and there were times that I would completely identify as a Christian and then times I'd completely deny him and, um, and everywhere in between. But the reality was I had not really been born again. And this is a concept that's hard to understand, but honestly, it, it's a work that God does. And it's really, um, being raised from death to life. Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins, but it wasn't just, um, to, to pay that debt, but really to raise us to life again. That's why he was raised from the dead to overcome that, to overcome sin, to overcome death. And then he begins to do a work in us. He, bega um, he begins to bring life. The, uh, he begins to um, change our heart, to change our mind, to change our, our thoughts, all of those things, and to, um, to change us from the inside out. Yeah, and I, I want to get into that journey in a bit. But before we do, <laughs> I, I want to come back to – no, but no I, I love that you explained that because that is the, the centerpiece of your story, right? We need to explain that before we kind of get into the, the darker, more difficult parts of the story. We'll come back to that. Um, you know, we have a few more minutes in this in this segment. I want to go back to what you were saying. You went to the support group. Within five minutes, they're telling you you're trans. They're affirming you. and you know, in that process, you then start taking steps to transition medically, socially. Were there any barriers? How difficult was that process of getting hormones, of going through? I mean, were there hoops? Take us through that that process that I guess the first steps you took and how hard it was. Yeah, it was surprisingly easy. I mean, the only barrier I really had, which is not even in place for a lot of kids now, but at least I was required to go to three sessions with a, a licensed therapist. So I went to see the psychologist and I was mindlessly answering the questions. I, I had no interest in counseling. I was not trying to work on my issues. I was just trying to get through this because it was a requirement so I could get this diagnosis and get the hormones. And in the third session, I'll never forget, she put down her notebook, she looked right in my eyes and she said, wow, you really have issues with your mom. And she was really broken for me. And I was stunned. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. How did we get from talking about me being a man to talking about my mother? And I said, I'm not here to talk about my mom. And I blew up at her. And she said, so you're just here to get this diagnosis. And I said, yes, that's all I'm here for. Like, I thought you knew that. And she said, okay. And she just gave me what I wanted. I took this letter stating I'd been diagnosed with gender identity disorder, which is what it was before they changed it to gender dysphoria. And I took this letter to my doctor who I'd been seeing for years. I'd never mentioned that I had any desire to be transgender. I had been, at the time I was dressing fairly feminine. Um, and that's actually, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of trans people try, quote, try really hard um, to be their natural sex before they embrace transgenderism. So I went through this phase where I was, I was trying really hard. So he had no indication that I'd struggled like this at all. But he sees this letter. He said, are you sure this is what you want to do? I said, yes, this is what I want to do. And he said, okay. He gave me my injection that day and then gave me a prescription to do it, uh, do the rest on my own. Did anybody at any point from a mental health professional down to a medical professional try to discourage this at all or give you any sort of roadmap of dangers or issues you might face? No. And the only one that questioned it at all was the therapist, but she never really helped me. I think she made the connection for in her mind, but she never helped me understand the connection. I thought it was completely unrelated. I thought she was saying, I just needed counseling for issues with my mom, but I didn't understand there was a connection there. And so I was like, no, I don't need counseling. I don't, I'm not interested in that. 
And so I think she did, but there was nobody else. I, you know, my doctor may have um, warned me at some point, but I wasn't listening. I was excited about this. I don't remember what he said. Um, he certainly didn't make sure that I really understood. Um, I think I remember, I, I knew that there was a risk of like um, heart disease and things like that, but you always think that it never happened to me. Right. <laughs> Um, right, and right. you're just you're just excited, and it's like uh, I I don't care. It's um, this is what I want to do, and I was so convinced at the time. It's like, well, even if I die young or whatever, and I didn't really think that was going to happen. But it's like, even if that was the case, I wanted this so bad. It's like I don't care what it costs me. I will do anything because I was absolutely convinced it's who I was, and I would never um, find happiness without it. You are listening to Unbelievable. I'm Billy Hollowell, and we're talking to Laura Perry Smaltz, who lived as a transgender man for nearly a decade before detransitioning. Um, Laura, when we come back, we're going to talk about other elements of your story, the changes you made, and how you came to faith. But we need to take a quick break right now. And for those listening and watching, don't forget to let us know what you think. You can email us at unbelievable at premier.org.uk, and we will see you again in just a moment. You would call yourself an atheist? I would, yes. I would call myself a Christian humanist. One of the big themes over the history of what we now think of as science has been questioning the exceptionalism of humankind. I think the critical thing is what gives something value. Would you say that minds construct meaning or detect meaning? I have had made from a little piece of my arm something that could reasonably be called a second brain. I think one of the real challenges that evolution by natural selection puts to Christian belief is the idea that Welcome back. I'm Billy Hollowell, your host on Premier Unbelievable. And we're talking here on Premier Unbelievable with Lori Perry Smaltz about her incredible journey. Now, Laura, I have to kind of go back here because there, there's so much in this story. But I want to ask, you went, you you got your injection on day one. Then you took a surgical route. And this this happened you know, fairly quickly. Talk about the changes that you made. Yeah. And even just the injections. I mean, at first, you know, um, my voice started to get lower, started to grow a little bit of body hair and facial hair. And it, um, my hips began to narrow and the fat sort of redistributes and your, your face starts to look different. And, and so I really began to believe, wow, this is going to be real one day. And I was really aware that it was very artificial that I'm doing this to my body. And, but it's like, well, it's going to be real one day because as you see these changes, it feels like um, there's sort of this conversion going on or this, you know, like you're um, becoming this. And so it's like, well, I realize it's fake now, but it's going to be real one day. And so I was looking forward to my surgery. Like this is really going to make me a man. I had my name legally changed. Um, but I really felt like the surgery was not only going to remove the breast, but it was going to make me legally male and I was like, I, and then I could get my birth certificate to say I'd been born male. And so this was kind of the pinnacle of everything. And I remember when I first had my double mastectomy and I, they did a little bit of plastic surgery just to make it look a little more like a male chest. And I thought, this is awesome. This is everything I've ever wanted. I, I was rid of this burden, the, these breasts that I hated that were so big and heavy. And I just was like, sort of felt free of all this. Um, and I loved looking in the mirror and looking at this masculine chest that I'd wanted for so long. But I remember getting depressed over the next few weeks and I kept trying to sweep it under the rug. I didn't want to admit I was depressed, but it was like, well, what now? First of all, I mean, like, OK, that that was sort of the the, um, the pinnacle of transition, you know. Um, but it's like, well, that didn't make me a man. I mean, even women have mastectomies for you know, um, for medical reasons, that didn't make me a man. So I thought, well, it's because I still have all these female organs. Um, once I get rid of all the female organs, then it will be real. And so I had a hysterectomy and I had the ovaries removed. Now I didn't realize this is so funny that I said this now because, 
Um, I didn't realize at the time that there are over 6,500 biological differences between men and women. Every single part of the body is designed differently as male or female. Your sex chromosomes are in every single cell of your body. And it's a biological impossibility to have a male brain in a female body or a female brain in a male body. Um, every part from the heart, the lungs, the hearing, the eyesight, the bones, the muscles, that everything is designed as male or female. So of course I didn't understand that. I didn't understand how this worked. And so I just believed like one day this is really gonna feel real. This dysphoria will go away. But as I continued down that journey um, and I get, begin to get really depressed after my hysterectomy and I realized that still didn't fix it. Like what is it that still causes this dysphoria? This still doesn't feel real. And I thought, well, it's because I, I need the general reassignment surgery. I was using um, sort of a prosthetic genitalia, but I hadn't had the surgery yet. And so when I began to look into those options, I was stunned at how fake it all was. Uh, wait a minute, this, this is supposed to be real. And it never dawned on me that I'd never father a child, um, that I would have to um, use an artificial pump or a pump to do this artificially. Um, that, I mean, there's just all kinds of endless problems, but also lots of complications. People have had the, to where the tissue just starts dying, infections, lots of problems with the, the urethra. That's a major problem in the phalloplasty surgeries. Um, and on top of that, there was a huge percentage at the time that would lose all sexual feeling permanently. And so I just began, I remember it was so soul crushing to realize that no matter what I did, this was never going to be real. And I remember, um, you know, I was so fresh. I spent thousands of dollars on all this prosthetic stuff and really realizing like, even if this was surgically attached to me, even if they use part of my arm muscle, which is what they do in phalloplasty, or there's, there's different muscles they can use. But I thought, even if they did that, that like, that still doesn't make this real. This is never going to be real. And I remember the devastation and going, like, I'm always going to be some freak somewhere in between. Even if people believe it, I knew the truth. And I got to the point where it began to haunt me. And I realized that I could not reinvent myself, that I couldn't get away from my past. And like every time I was around my family, even if they never said anything about my transition, I still knew that I was their daughter, their brother. I mean, their uh, sister, my brother's sister, you know, um, I was their aunt, their whatever. You know, I couldn't get away from the memories and the, the reality of who I was, um, even though I was trying to reinvent my life all the time. And so I would be telling a story to somebody because now I was at a job where I was only known as male. I passed very well. And they would um, I would say, wait a minute, uh, you know, it, it, it couldn't have been in uh, couldn't have been in Girl Scouts. I had to have been in Boy Scouts. I, you know, I couldn't have been in softball. It had to have been baseball. Every part, every part of it yeah. had to comport, right? right? Every piece of the puzzle for you. But you weren't, you were having the social trans, you, you had done the social transition. You were doing every, almost everything medical that you could do at that point. And still you're not feeling any different. How deep into the nine, 10 years were you when you had that final realization of this is not ever going to happen? Yeah, probably about six years. And, um, you know, I was really, really depressed. And I remember even, um, I was telling my, my boss one day about, um, an ex-boyfriend and I'm going on and on about this story until I realized, um, or she realized, wait a minute, as far as she knew, I was a man. She didn't know that I was trans. And, um, she knew that I was, um, I was quote married. I wasn't actually legally married, but as far as she knew, I was married to a woman. My, my partner was actually a male to female transgender. Um, but she just thought it was this man that was heterosexual. And so she's like, Jake, do you swing both ways? And I remember the, the horror and the alarm bells going off and like, how do I cover this? And I remember getting so angry and realizing that I couldn't do this the rest of my life. It was so maddening and it was driving me absolutely crazy trying to live this lie that I wanted so desperately to be true, but it wasn't true. And I remember feeling like what had promised to be freedom had become my prison cell um, because I was a slave to that identity. Everything. I had to constantly think about how a man would walk, how a man would talk, um, how he would dress. And like uh, things like I remember my partner pointing out one day that men buckle their belt backwards or so. I mean, you don't even know. I, I didn't even know if these things were necessarily true, but there were stereotypical things or like it is true that men's buttons tend to be on the other side of the shirt. I mean, there were all these little details and it was driving me crazy trying to make everything fit this image and realizing that this is all completely fake. 
And so I, I was just in this mental hell and uh, just, I was so tired of living this life and realizing how fake this was. And this prosthetic that I was using was giving me lots of infections and um, just, uh, I was leaking on myself and just all kinds of problems. And so I was, I realized that I was in my own hell that I had created. And I realized this was never going to be real. But every time I thought about going back to being a female, it was more pain than I could ever even imagine. And so I was just, I was devastated. And I thought that's too painful. But my parents had been praying for me and they had had a lot of other people praying for me. I didn't realize that um, my parents had been changing. I'd noticed over the years that they were getting more and more, you know, sort of religious, but they were changing it. It didn't seem anymore. They weren't preaching at me anymore. They weren't just like, um, following the rules and checking the boxes, something was changing. My parents started to be filled with this joy that I couldn't explain. Um, and they were so excited talking about Jesus. And it was like, I don't know what's happening to y'all, but like something is different. But then over the years, um, I, I really came to the point where I was working on a website for my mom and, um, I started asking her questions about what she was teaching. I just got kind of curious. Um, I really wasn't interested at first, but it was like, um, things would just kind of jump out at me and I would, um, I'd get curious. And so, but I began to notice how much my mom had changed. All of a sudden the Lord really opened my eyes and my mom was filled with faith and peace. I'll never forget the peace in my mom after years of, like I said, if I picture her from childhood, all I could see is the stress and just go away. And like, and the fact that my mom was really pursuing me for a relationship that she wanted to engage with me, that she's filled with peace and patience and faith. And I remember one time I was trying to make this big decision and my mom had always told me, you know, like the logical thing to do. And I remember her saying, honey, you just need to trust the Lord. And I was like, what? Like, what does that even mean? Who are you and what have you done with my mom? And that, that was really the beginning of that journey. I went home that night and I was like, Lord, I want what my mom has. And I really, for the first time in my life, this is what began to transform me. For the first time in my life, I had an awareness of my own sin as I began to repent of everything I could think of. And I began to ask the Lord to reveal my sin to me that I could, because I just wanted to be clean. I wanted to, I didn't really understand yet, but I wanted to be forgiven and I wanted to, um, to be reconciled with God, even though I didn't quite understand it all. But as he began to reveal things to me that I had done, I was so overcome with the realization of my own sin. And I began to cry out to God with all my heart. And I didn't know, I didn't know how to like quote, get saved. You know, I didn't know what that, I didn't know that I, what I didn't know. I didn't know that I had never truly been changed by God. I didn't know that I had never really believed the gospel, even though I had, um, I had believed intellectually the Bible was true. But now all of a sudden, Jesus was real to me because I'd seen him transform my mom. And as I began to cry out to him and ask him to save me and to forgive me, my heart got so radically transformed. And I really was a completely different person. My heart began to change. My attitudes began to change. My thoughts began to change. My desires began to change. And it was something I couldn't explain, except it's like I had been made a new person. And that's what the Bible says that in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says that if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new, but it's a journey and a process. And I think sometimes people judge Christians and say, well, they don't represent Christ. Well, it, it's a journey. You, it, it begins to change, but it doesn't change all at once. Um, this is, in fact, this is the true transformation. The whole gender transition is such a counterfeit Satan always counterfeits what God wants. And so the reality is we do need to be made a new person. There, people hate themselves. They're, they're disillusioned. They don't like who they are. And they are trying to reinvent themselves to become their own creator. And they don't realize that that's actually what God is offering to make you a new person. We have this desire to be made new, to be sort of born, to be born again. But it's, but we begin to try to solve that ourselves rather than humbling ourselves before God and saying, God, I need you to do this because only God can do that in us because he's our creator. And so as, as I begin to change over time, I, I wanted to be a man of God. I didn't understand that God wasn't going to leave me there. Could you have imagined that you'd be sitting here right now as your biological gender? Oh, absolutely doing not. You're doing now? <laughs> 
<laughs> no, in fact, it's hilarious. I and not only because I was not only angry with my mom, I really was angry with women in general. I didn't. And it's funny how we make we say there's no difference between men and women, but people it, when they get wounded and hurt, they will make judgments on the entire sex. And this happens all the time. You know, like if, if a man hurts them, well, men can't be trusted or, you know, whatever it might be. And so we, we do this naturally. Um, so I had all these judgments against women. I didn't want anything to do with women. And then God, this last job that I had, God put me in an office entirely of women. <laughs> then I get saved and um, I begin to change and I really begin to forgive. Uh, well, actually, when the Lord asked me to leave this lifestyle and it was harder than I could ever even imagine, I did not want to leave that lifestyle. It's not like I, I suddenly decided I didn't like being trans. I, I hated being trans and I hated the fakeness of it all, but I desperately wanted to be a man. Um, and I just, I couldn't even bear the thought of going back to being a woman, but God began to call me to this. And I'll never forget one day I really threw myself before the Lord. I said, God, I want everything you have for me. I, cause I had seen God, he was building my faith little by little and showing me that he had a plan and a purpose for me. And he was using me to impact people's lives. And I, I wanted so desperately to be a part of that and to, to have, I wanted everything God had for me. And I said, God, what do you want from me? And God asked me a question. He said, if you stood before me tonight, what name would I call? And I, I was, I remembered hearing God call me Laura in my prayers. And I said, God, that's not fair. I've repented of this. I said, I was sorry. I know that this was not your will, but I can't do anything about it now. I've had all these surgeries. I've, had, I've taken all these hormones. I have facial hair. I'm only known as a man. I'm fully passing as trans or as a man. And the Lord reminded me that Jesus Christ himself is the creator. And he said, you can't claim to love me and yet reject my creation. And I thought I was being condemned because I was not going to go back to being a woman. But in the most loving voice I've ever heard in all my life, he whispered to me and he said, let me tell you who you are. And that was the beginning of what began to change me. It wasn't in that. It's not like in that moment I went, oh, yes, Lord, I agree. And I'm, I'm going to be a woman. I This was the hardest thing I'd ever heard in my life. And so many times Christians don't want to offend people. They, they don't want to say something that might be hurtful. But sometimes God... Um, says things that we don't really want to hear, but that we desperately need to hear. And so I, I didn't want to hear this. I was like, God, please, I'll do anything else. You can have everything. I, you know, I'll go be a missionary in Africa. Like, I don't care. Like you can have everything else, but the Lord began to call this, um, call for this. And I, I honestly just started begging the Lord to take my life. It's like, God, I can't do that. This is too hard. Um, but I didn't understand that, that that's actually God calls us to come and die to ourselves, not because he, he's not trying to destroy us, but what we don't understand and what you may not understand if you have not ever truly experienced the, the radical transforming power of Christ, you know, that um, we're taught so often that, that Jesus is like this little missing piece in our life, but actually we're part of Jesus's life. He wants to make us part of something so much greater. That's what people are longing for in the LGBT community, a sense of belonging. That's what God offers in his family. They're, they're, they're longing for a greater purpose, a greater identity, all these things that God is offering and Satan's trying to sell such a cheap counterfeit to do it your own way and your own strength and your own resources. But what God had was so much greater than this. And what he calls us for us to die to ourselves, to be willing to trust him, to give him our life. And in exchange, he makes us part of his life, part of his eternal kingdom that will never pass away. And so when I finally made that decision, Lord, I want you more than my next breath. And I will come and die to myself. I will give and surrender my life to you. Not just to not go to hell, but really to live for Christ. I began to be radically, radically transformed. And like, um, and you trusted. Absolutely. This was trust. You it walked was. away from what you wanted in trust for what he had for you. Right. And I honestly, I had no hope of transformation at the time. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand the power of God. I didn't know. I didn't think I would ever feel like a girl again. I didn't think I'd ever look like a girl again. I didn't think I'd ever want to be a girl again. I was just going to be trans and deny that for Christ. Um, but over time, God began to absolutely transform me. 
as um, I begin to forgive my mom, I begin to forgive um, all the women that had hurt me. I begin to forgive all the men that had hurt me. And then I begin to repent of my own sin. And I begin to bring down those walls in my heart. I begin to let go of all the bitterness. Um, I begin to, he began to replace the lies with the truth. And it's like over time, like the layers of an onion, I just, he began to heal me and transform me. I mean, I couldn't explain it. This was a supernatural work of God. You know, what's, uh, what's impossible with man is possible with God. You know, and it's like, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. When when you give your life to Christ, that power comes inside you. Because I'm sure so many people out there that are listening, maybe you've tried to fix yourself for so long. I felt like as a little kid, just as a short side story, I, I had to play Humpty Dumpty once for um, a, a school play. And I remember I feeling like, if you've never heard that story about the, the egg that falls off the wall and it cracks and nobody can put it back together again. Well, that's what I felt like. You know, like, no, I was so shattered and broken. Nobody could put it back together. But what what I was not able to do, God was able to do. And I've seen him absolutely transform my life. And then I, I little by little, I began to be more and more comfortable in my own skin. I began to love myself more. I began to accept myself more. And then all of a sudden, I began to realize that other people accepted me as a woman. People um, enjoyed me as a woman. And I began to embrace being a woman and i began to get freer and freer and freer and it was really a walk of faith with the lord but then ultimately you know god has given me an absolute love of his design of male and female of how he created us um, embracing womanhood but also he brought an incredible man into my life i um just over a year ago i was married to my amazing husband uh, perry smaltz and so it has been this incredible journey to see that God did something that was so impossible for me. God completely healed and redeemed my life. And so that's my encouragement for, for anybody listening when you're thinking like, I, this is too hard. I can't do that. I can't like, we, we tend to trust our own feelings rather than trust God, but we don't understand that God can transform us. And that's what he wants for us to make us part of his eternal life. Well, and, you know, I have to, I have to say to you, you know, we're looking at a culture right now where these issues are so prevalent. And we look at a story like yours and what you just shared, how God has changed your life. What do you say to somebody right now who is watching this and they're feeling the way you were? They're feeling lost, destitute, desperate, looking for belonging, feeling like they're in the wrong body. You know, you've been through this. What would you say to them right now? Yeah, I absolutely get it. And your feelings are real in a sense. You really do feel that way. I'm not invalidating your feelings, but the reality is our feelings can be very deceptive. Um, just like um, people, for example, sometimes um, that get very depressed and they don't realize there's a there may be a chemical imbalance in the brain. And even though you're really feeling that way, if we acted on our feelings all the time, the suicide rates would be a whole lot higher. You know, um, our feelings can be very, very deceptive. But the reality is what we don't realize is that there's so many wounds that go into, there's this two-sided coin of we've been greatly sinned against, but we've responded in sin. And so we we're, often there may be people that you have kind of cut off. There may be people that you have, you've made inner vows maybe of I'll never be like so-and-so. Maybe you haven't had, um, most boys that struggle with gender or sexuality in almost every case I've ever heard of have an issue with their father. Maybe he was not around much. Maybe he abandoned you. Maybe he was just not emotionally available. Whatever it might be, um, and you end up kind of clinging to mom and the feminine becomes familiar. For me, it was the opposite. I, my mom was there, but not really there for me. Um, and so I began to really cling to my dad. I cut my mom off um, or maybe you've been bullied. There, there could be a hundred different things, but until those things are dealt with, until we really begin to give those over to the Lord as we begin, that's why forgiveness is so powerful. The forgiveness of, and that really comes from Christ in our own natural flesh. It, it's not natural to forgive. It's natural to, to want to take revenge, but actually it's God's ways are not our ways. And God wants to heal us through the power of forgiveness and loving people and letting go of all those things. Cause we're actually just hurting ourselves. You know, our culture right now, um, really across the globe in many areas in, in the West in particular is affirming 
you know, the transgender lifestyle and promoting it. And you're seeing this everywhere. You talked about your journey starting in 2007. And here we are now. Things are very different, as you said. How do you think that is impacting this issue, even on a granular level? Yeah, I mean, and it is, and you're seeing people don't realize the influence that um, like a celebrity has, like when uh, Bruce Jenner came out as trans, I mean, it's just like a floodgate opened. But now you're seeing um, so many being influenced by that, but you're also seeing there are thousands and thousands of detransitioners out there. There are so many people that regret, but you're not hearing a lot of these stories. The media doesn't cover it, but I'm on a Reddit forum that has, um, it's supposed to be just detransitioners and there are a few that are like questioning, um, but it, it's called detrans and there are over like 45,000 members last time I looked. And so there are so many people that regret, um, that realize this isn't real and that's never brought any kind of peace or satisfaction. In fact, studies have shown, like the Tavistock study, in their own internal study, um, they, they conclude that this was not helping the mental health of their patients. When, when you look at your journey, and I think this is important to emphasize, there are some things that you have lost in that journey uh, but there's also a lot now that you have gained in coming into your faith and understanding who you are under God, as you described. But talk a little bit about those losses before we go here, the things that you know are lasting impacts from, from this journey that you've been on. Yeah, I mean, I have real consequences from it. I'm not able to have my own children, which I didn't really want children before. I mean, I didn't. I didn't necessarily not want them, but it, it wasn't a big deal. But when I got married, that desire just came alive. And I, that has been a great source of grief that I can't have children with my husband. Um, but also I, I don't have natural breasts. I've now had breast implants, um, but it's not the same. It, you know, these, they don't feel real. And it's just like, there's such a lie out there that tells people, oh, if you change your mind later, like you can totally get, get it back. And like, people look at me now and I look very feminine. Oh, I can just go back. The people have no idea how hard this has been and the pain I've been through and the brokenness I still have over the choices I made. And I still have to shave every day. And like, you know, just the, like, um, I've been going through a lot of electrolysis, which is extremely painful and very expensive. Um, I still need a whole bunch more treatments, but um, it's been a very difficult and painful process and God undoing all these things. So even though God's been able, it's also been extremely costly to me. Um, so I want to encourage anyone who's done this, like no matter how far you've gone, no matter what you've done to your body, God can redeem and restore all things. But if you're questioning this, if you're thinking maybe this would be good for me, um, please, I, this is such a lie from the, from the devil and it's such a counterfeit of what God is offering you. God is offering you all the belonging, worth, and value you're seeking. So, Laura, one of the things that has been very shocking to people around the globe has been the rise in women, young girls who are questioning their gender identity, their biology. What do you think is behind this culturally? Well, I think there's a lot of things that may be going into it. I, we see this social contagion where these girls are deciding in groups sometimes. There's a lot of peer pressure. Um, I've actually heard from some girls that um, they're actually being put down cisgender, as they call it, which is not transgender or not some other gender, is actually a derogatory term that has become it um, really kind of a put down. And kids are feeling like they're on the outside. Um, there's pressure to um, to be to identify as LGBT. So that's part of it. I think another part of it is the the pornography that these kids have been exposed to on their on the smartphones on these other devices that is extremely violent and extremely objectifying of women. And this has to be terrifying to these young girls who are looking at this and going, Oh my gosh, if that's what it means to be a woman, I don't want to be a woman. I think it feels unsafe. Um, and I think because of the rise in pornography, there's also been a lot of sexual play among kids um, where their kids are being molested. Um, so that's part of it. But really, the um, I think so much of it is is the objectification of women um, and just this this culture of really tearing down what it means to be male or female. We're, we're told that men are toxic and they're all bad. And so there's these judgments against men. But then there it feels unsafe and vulnerable to be a woman. I think there's so much confusion and so much fear and so much lack of confidence to be 
who they are. And nobody likes their body at, at puberty. That That's part of We don't teach these kids that it's really normal and natural to feel awkward at puberty. We used to all talk about that. But now kids are being told if they have any discomfort in their body, that means you're trans. And it's just not true. And so I think kids really need to be taught that this is a natural, normal process. And in fact, studies years ago showed that if kids were not socially affirmed as trans, like those that were struggling with uh, dysphoria, um, if they were not socially affirmed as, as the opposite sex, but they were um, just encouraged, maybe got counseling, and they would um, grow out of it most of the time, like 82, I think it was like 82 to 86%, something like that would grow out of it after puberty. That's the very thing they need. And now they're trying to block it. But that's actually what helps us sort of be, um, begin to identify with our body and be more comfortable. But if we have issues that we've not dealt with from childhood, from people that have hurt us, from whatever it is, judgments we've made, whatever that might be, if we don't deal with that, like in my case, that doesn't get resolved. But so much of that discomfort with your body and that alienation feeling, puberty actually really helps those things. Well, and, and you look at the, the pornography issue you mentioned, all of these things, it's almost the perfect storm, right? You even have some places in California, in the United States, where, you know, there, there are, are legislation, pieces of legislation to push back on parental rights on this. And you have all these things happen happening. And you have to say, as a parent, if, if there are parents out there watching or listening to this, what is my responsibility for what my child is looking at on social media, right? Because if you're struggling with any of these these things or somebody's encouraging you and then you're seeing social media videos over and over again that are endorsing this transition that's a whole other piece of the puzzle we know the impact that media has on people so that that's a part of this too wouldn't you say yeah absolutely and you know i've, I've watched kids at the grocery store glued to their phone at like three years old um we, we've got to be more diligent as parents to um to put guards safeguards there's technology you can put on your phones to um you know, like covenant eyes and there's more ever accountable. There's different, like different filtering services. There's lots of options out there. Um, but really putting some safeguards in place, but also talking to your children about what they've experienced. Um, because again, this is not, this is not any parent's fault. I, I don't like, sometimes people hear my story and they think I'm blaming my mom, but we're, the reality is we're all broken and we have hurt each other. So we need to model forgiveness. We need to model um, really reconciling and, and working through our issues, learning to talk about. Sometimes kids feel like um, they're the only one that has problems because we all act like we have this perfect image. And so I think sometimes that humility and that vulnerability and that openness to, to share with them how, um, how God is helping us overcome, that can be extremely helpful as well. Um, but yeah, putting those, just those conversations with kids, what they're watching, what they think about what they're watching, what they're hearing in school, what they're hearing in the culture, and being willing to wade into those difficult conversations. Absolutely. Laura, I appreciate you sharing this journey with us on Premiere Unbelievable today, talking with us and taking us through the ups and the downs and what you've learned. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. 